I'm sure most of you already know this, but some might have forgotten. So just as a quick refresher, Affiliates Club is entirely financed by its Patreon. Uh, the patrons who decide to give a little bit of money, a little bit of value to the show are the people who make it possible. So if you think that this show is somehow entertaining, uh, fun or interesting or has some kind of value for you, please do consider giving a little bit of value back. And thanks a million to those who already do. This is The Phineas Club episode 118, If You Think You Understand. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Phineas Club. This is the show where we cover, well, I guess we cover the news from the world, but not really. We cover the news that are important in each of our local areas of said world. Uh, local areas might be quite large, but we try to focus on those with, well, I mean, sometimes they're world uh, uh, impacting news, but we try to focus on them with local opinions and our cultural backgrounds and try to give you our different uh, uh, takes on those local news uh, and and uh, try to give you different opinions on those that you might not have had, although sometimes it's exactly what you expect. Um, today, I'm very glad. Oh, first of all, my name is Patrick Beja and I'm currently living in Finland. But I'm originally from France, and I have news from both of those uh, countries. And we also have other people from the Western world this time. Uh, Tom Merritt is here with us from Thanksgiving riddled California. <laughs> yes, it, it is just peppered with Thanksgiving everywhere. <laughs> uh, the uniquely American holiday, Thanksgiving, uh, although I guess Canada has their own. It's not the same day as ours. Uh, so yeah, it's that one holiday that we all celebrate for sure and no one else does. <laughs> it, there aren't many of those, I suppose. There, there are many. versions no, yeah. of every holiday, it, different versions of most holidays in every country. Yeah, Thanksgiving, yeah. though, um, yeah, if, if you, you know, uh, uh, don't include that weird Canadian one, which I'm guessing is a copy of the American one, because <laughs> everything in Canada is a, a, a kinder copy of the American version. Um, They're so sorry about it, but they come. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks for being on with us. Uh, you're going to be talking about fires. and Yes, I like to think that I am... Uh, living in California, but originally from Illinois, which distance-wise is kind of like being from France and living in Finland, <laughs> although it's still all America. And uh, California uh, suffer has al always su suffered fires. That is not unusual, but the fires have gotten worse and worse, uh, and there is an effect of climate change that, that is fueling that. There are other reasons that are fueling that as well. And this year, uh, one of the worst if not, I think it may have been determined to be the worst fire on record in California. It happened in Northern California. We had two very damaging fires in mm -hmm. Southern California. And I uh, have relatives up in San Jose that we traveled to visit. So I, I sort of got a boots on the ground inhalation of smoke in both locations. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure a lot of listeners, most listeners have heard about this, even if they're, in they're not in the U.S., uh, mostly because it was, you know, uh, uh, present all over social networks and podcasts. Yeah. I, I think uh, and many celebrities are. Yeah, I, for me, it wasn't so much the celebrities, although I guess podcasting that's how you get celebrities. The news. Yeah, um, right. because every podcast I listen to, or uh, many of them, are recorded in California. And right, so, right. Yeah. Uh, but we'll get a little bit uh, more details on that, and maybe some of the context surrounding it. Uh, we also have. Bruce from uh, Scotland slash Hello. the United Kingdom. How's it going, Bruce? Yeah, yeah, it's it's going. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's going. yeah, you you are going to be talking to us about Brexit, which is its own special brand of uh, I don't know. I was going to say forest fire. I was going to say dumpster is, yeah. fire, but I don't want to you know make fun of fires because it's not fun at the moment but 
Um, Being the person in California affected them. I, I think you can compare Brexit to a kind of fire, and it's not too <laughs> offending. Now, you asked me to be as impartial as possible, and, and this is how you open it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, I think the unique situation of Brexit currently is that after, what, two years of negotiations, both mm -hmm. sides are still incredibly unhappy about everything. And I think in that sense, uh, it's yeah. fine to say it's a dumpster fire and still be yeah. neutral because everyone <laughs> thinks it's a dumpster fire. <laughs> so, I don't think anyone is happy at the moment. So yeah, I do agree here. Yeah. No. And enough. so we'll dive into this and uh, your tone is sort of, uh, well, <laughs> I guess setting the tone for uh, the tone of that conversation. So we'll see where we uh, get with that. Uh, I'll also be talking about uh, stuff from Finland and from France. Uh, Finland has to do with babies and uh, France has to do with, you know, those security jackets, like the yellow reflective jackets? The I, high visibility, high, high vis, right, they call those them. things. Yeah. Uh, well, it has to do with that. And you might think, oh, it's going to be the funny, um, you know, kicker story. That's the the feel, feel good one. It, it really isn't. Um, I mean, it's not horrible, but it's 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 kind of a possibly a moment of reckoning for the country slash the government. Uh, mm. But we'll talk about this in just a little bit. I think first. You know what? Let's get the uh, depression out of the way <laughs> um, and talk about Brexit, which I think has been making the news, I want to say worldwide. I'm going to open the Brexit segment with asking Tom, actually, uh, if some Brexit managed to make the news between two uh, forest fires. <laughs> yes, it, it, it absolutely did. Although I'm always a horrible test case for this because right. um, I get my news from The Economist and the BBC, which are both British based publications. Mm -hmm. uh, but but even so, I, I think Brexit has 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 been something that people have heard of I'm, uh, over in the United States quite a bit. It's it's at the top of the news. And and I've been following the the mess that it is uh, with great interest to to the point that, you know, at one point I tweeted last week that this season of House of Cards is great. And of course, I'm referring to Theresa May's administration, <laughs> not the one on Netflix, uh, because it, it's just it has just been fascinating, not necessarily in a positive way, but fascinating to just watch the slow motion wreck that is happening as they essentially, from my perspective, get caught up on how to treat a border that they want to leave open while closing the rest of the border. Yeah, it seems mm -hmm. that's the, 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 the key point. But uh, let's get to, to, to Bruce. Um, and so yes. tell us, from here we've been hearing they found a deal and no one likes that deal. And we're like, what yeah. the hell do you want? And so, Bruce, tell us, what do you want? <laughs> what do we want? What do the British people want? To be great again, I think, just like America. <laughs> uh, um, well, it all started uh, way back uh, about what feels like months ago, uh, but I think it was only a couple of weeks where um, uh, Theresa May came up and said uh, they'd been, been in with her cabinet and they got a deal and everyone would support it. And it was fantastic. And, you know, she was glad that everyone had agreed to it. Uh, it later turned out it was wasn't it was a majority vote. So the cabinet that had voted on it who were, were deeply split. Uh, this is my understanding of it. And then uh, the next day, the Brexit secretary uh, Dominic Raab um, came out and resigned uh, because he didn't. Uh, his words were cannot in good conscience support the terms that proposed for our deal with the EU. And following that, I think the last count was uh, up to 19 uh, conservative uh, ministers resigned their posts um, in uh, protest uh, of the deal, uh, basically saying that it wasn't what what it wasn't what we voted for. I'm, I'm putting up uh, what when you say what we voted for, you mean uh, during the Brexit vote? Yeah, or? yeah. I'm putting okay. up my my fingers here and in uh, inverted commas, which is great, great podcast. <laughs> uh, so um, just so, so I understand the process here, the proposal was was essentially agreed upon. Uh, uh, or, uh, I mean, uh, supposedly with the agreement of the, the Brexit minister, I'm guessing. Um, yes. And then it was made 
public and the EU was okay with it and Theresa May at least was okay with it and and the high government officials of the UK were supposedly okay with it then it was made public and the the, the people who like in order for it to pass it would have need to be voted on by what parliament i'm guessing yeah it would need to, it needs to go through parliament which is going to happen in the next uh, i think it's over the weekend where it's going to be um, or, or close to it uh, where it's going to be voted on but uh, but back then it was it was my understanding that was before it went to uh, the eu it was basically internally agreeing uh, the deal that what we we wanted to propose given all the negotiations that had happened with the EU and what we thought the EU would agree with. Right. I'm guessing um, in that case, they they would probably draft something that they think the EU would be okay with. Uh, yeah. With a few details, maybe. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, uh, you know, it, when, when it, the details of the uh, deal had been published you can you can understand why um wh why the the hardline brexiters are not brexiteers are not very happy with it um it basically <laughs> what it does is it 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 means that we leave the eu but we still we still retain the laws uh some some form of judicial um, oversight, so the European Court of Justice would still have a say. Uh, would, there would still be a customs union um, with some, um, and I've been trying to figure this out, uh, some kind of technological uh, solution to the Irish border problem, which uh, if people don't know about, uh, Northern Ireland is a part of the United Kingdom, uh, we, and it is on the same island as the Republic of Ireland. And uh, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, um, which was agreed, uh, might, I might get this wrong, 1998 or 99 uh, by uh, Tony Blair at the time, um, basically uh, guarantees, it guaranteed, uh, it, it was a... An, an agreement between Ireland and the UK that there will never be a hard border uh, between Northern Ireland and Ireland, um, but that Northern Ireland would stay within um, the United Kingdom. And that, my understanding is that, at least looking at it from the outside, this mm -hmm. is the main issue that is blocking everything else. Uh, but yeah. I think what you're saying is, it isn't really the only one because there are issues of oversight and well, correct me if I'm wrong. The way you're describing it is the Brexit deal is kind of Brexiting without really Brexiting. Like, is well, it? <laughs> that, 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 that's why, that's why I can only laugh. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain this in, in, in terms that make sense, but, but it doesn't make <laughs> sense to me because uh, the deal says we will, we will leave we will leave the eu but we will stay within the customs union for the moment but there will be a technological solution in the future um the that will that will solve the issue of the border because the the two proposals are one is put the board you'd have to put a border at uh between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and that uh, completely nullifies the Good Friday Agreement, and um, that wouldn't be very good for uh, for for the region. Um, the, the the troubles in Ireland were were all about that. The other the other solution, which the um, uh, Unionist Irish would are very unhappy about, is to put uh, a border within the sea so between ireland and the united kingdom and they say well you know we, we're not going to be part of ireland anymore we're not going to be part of the united kingdom anymore so you know that that there's that uh, so but this nobody is can definitely figure out yeah this is definitely i mean the the irish border issue for those who who don't know about this issue uh it's possible they don't as you're describing it it's kind of unsolvable because the eu borders are open um, between the countries of the EU and Ireland, the Republic, the Republic of Ireland is part of the EU. 
But Northern Ireland is part of the UK, and of course, one of the main contentions of the Brexit is that the UK wants to control its own borders. So the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland uh, is kind of either it's open, and then the UK is has a border open with the EU, which Brexit doesn't want. I'm treating Brexit as a you know sentient <laughs> entity at this point, um, or it's closed. And uh, that's not okay because obviously in the UK, as you explained, uh, they don't want that border to be closed. So I guess my question is, what do hardline Brexiters propose as a solution to this problem? Well, it's uh, what they've said is, you know, we'll, we'll use technology. That's... That's basically what their what their blockchain what their result is. AI will solve well, it. Yeah, well, you know, to 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 um, to use a famous phrase now, uh, we've all got mobile phones, so uh, you know, why don't we just use those to track where people are, etc. That was one of the comments that came up. What? Um, yeah, How does was, that like you're you, you're tracking every person in real time in in the in in uh, Ireland? What's the, how does that help? First of all. I'm guessing people who want the Brexit are, want the closed border because they want to make sure no, uh, you know, uh, uh, unsavory people get into the country. I'm quite certain that people can leave their cell phone at home and cross the border and they wouldn't be tracked. Um, well, they'd be so yeah, bored, that, Patrick. That's that's <laughs> that's. Uh, that's very advanced thinking of you leaving yourself <laughs> at home and going. I, I don't think anyone thought of that, Patrick. It's, I know. Um, I'm. 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 Uh, I'm advanced. Thank you. You sneaky Europeans. You. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, we're, we're not even mentioning that's why the we issues. Brexit in the first place. <laughs> I'm not even mentioning the issues of you know privacy problems. But yeah, uh, yeah. Th th this is this is an issue, and uh, it's one that. Um, I don't think has come has been sorted out, and there have been uh, discussions about. Well, you know, maybe Northern Ireland is a special case because Northern Ireland did vote Remain, so maybe maybe we should uh, we should give them a bit of, bit of a pass, and that that comes into problems because Scotland also voted Remain, um, and uh, oh, you know, overwhelmingly. So it, it, it's a it's a situation now where England and Wales have voted for something and. They want to keep the union together, but they want to leave the EU. But uh, I, Northern Ireland and, and Scotland are saying, well, you know. Uh, but So <laughs> that, that problem has existed since the beginning uh, of yeah, the Brexit negotiations. Yeah. What's new now is that there was a deal that was agreed upon, at least in the UK, but essentially is the, the government seems to be disintegrating following that yeah. uh, package that was put together. Um, yeah, that, that that's effectively what's happening. Um, I'm still I'm surprised today that it's you know that 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 it's still that Theresa May is still in power. I think it's a situation where there's just nothing, nothing to fill the void if if she were to go. So nobody wants to push that that house of cards down because the opposition, the Labour Party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, if if he wanted to, he could win a landslide election if he just said one word of support for remain um okay in my opinion he could win a landslide election mm -hmm. um but he's not and he is coming from a very uh a far left uh point of view in that he he, he hasn't said it outright but i think he wants to leave the EU too, for different reasons. Um, he's very much in um, in the mind that everything should be renationalized, the railways. Um, uh, he doesn't want the NHS to be sold off, which is fine. You know, I, I wouldn't want that too. Um, but he he's he's very much a socialist in that he wants. Well, uh, I'm sure he could do that within the confines of the EU. Um, <laughs> Although the railways, you need to have competition, but you can have one. Yeah, it's it's yeah. maybe a little there, bit. There, there are competition laws within the EU that mm. would block his idea of you know the 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 nation as a as as a whole and the okay. the, the you know the the very. Um, Almost, it is socialist. It's socialist. Okay. It's not not communist. But so, All right. So, so, yeah. By the way, socialism and communism, as they are implemented now, very different things. It, oh, it annoys me to no end to hear Americans use socialism when they mean uh, uh, 
communism, even right. though, of course, you know, historically the term is what it is. But anyway, uh, I, I feel like I'm not really understanding what's happening still, <laughs> Bruce. Um, well, uh, t can I can I throw in, you know, two perspectives from just following the story that I, I, I think I don't think help you understand it, but are important <laughs> to consider. Uh, one is that this isn't even the Brexit agreement. This is the agreement of what we'll do in the transition period after the Brexit oh, has yes. to happen in March because we haven't figured out what to do. So they're, they're still like, a, a, they're just agreeing like, okay, we'll have a transition period where you'll still be part of the customs union and, and this is what will happen to residents while we still figure out what this is going to be. And the other point to consider is, especially regarding that Irish border, Theresa May's government is not a majority government. It's a coalition government with the Democratic Unionist Party from uh -huh. Ireland who are very opposed to this Brexit agreement that Theresa May is bringing, which, you know, adds to that flavor of her administration, you know, teetering on the edge because she's trying to keep them happy. And that is the biggest problem is whether to have a border or not. And the DUP is, you know, unionist is yeah. right there in, in the name, uh, isn't necessarily uh, the, the friendliest party to some yeah. kind of compromise where they would put a border in the Irish Sea or something like that. Yeah, but you yeah. know, we're, we're kind of laughing off this border issue, but for all of the discussions and all of the uh, uh, reporting I've seen and read, no one is proposing anything that actually solves it. No, you know, the you it, can't. It's, it is unsolvable. And it, it, it's staggering that no one is actually saying, you know, everything about Brexit is somehow solvable. You know, you could have a hard Brexit. Like that's the 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 responses I've gotten. Well, you could um, have it, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, but theoretically, it's not good yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not. Yeah, obviously, it's not a good idea. But the the, the answer I've gotten from people is, well, just do a hard Brexit, and without yeah. you know, I think only yeah. the hardest core of the hardcore Brexiters are arguing that this would be fine. I think everyone else understands a hard Brexit would not be. You know, I think the, there's this idea that the hard Brexit would be three months of difficulties economically, and then it would be fine, and you know the UK would be super happy. And there's only a few people who think that. Everyone else understands it would wreck uh, the, the economy. It would be uh, uh, chaos in the country, and people would lose well, their and jobs. It might, and right? It might bring back the troubles in Ireland if you did a hard yep. Brexit. Yeah, on, on top that. of that. So, so the, the, I mean, the hard Brexit, in theory, it could happen. This border issue literally has no solution so as long no. as you make it a condition to an agreement for the Brexit, it just can't happen. I just, I mean, the, the entire focus of this entire conversation should be, do you have a solution for that Irish border? And no. my understanding, Bruce, is that this is not what the conversation no. is. It's devolving into, oh, we can Brexit. No, we can't Brexit without yeah. this focus on the Irish border, right? Well, well the, the, this is this is the you you what you've both said that Tom and uh, Patrick is exactly the issue is that there is no there's no solution here that 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 especially no solution that uh, uh, makes the hard Brexit uh, the hard right uh, happy. Uh, it's just not it's too intertwined at the moment. It there's a uh, um, analogy of taking eggs out of a cake. You know, we want to take the eggs back from the cake, but we've yeah. already boiled. We, you know, we've already baked the cake. We can't take the eggs. That, and and there's some truth to that. In that, there's a lot of Europeanness, and a lot of uh, you know the Euro the the way things work now there's things that we take for granted that are going to go and people are just now realizing that when if you, you if we visit it's a very simple thing if you visit europe from the uk now you don't necessarily need to take a passport you walk straight through automated um uh checkpoints i, I did it i went to belgium a couple of weeks ago and, and i walked straight through nothing you know uh, you just look into a camera and go and um it, it's very easy to do and now uh people are thinking people are being told well you know you you're not going to be able to do that anymore you're going to have to get into the queue with non-eu members and people are like what what you know, how and can they do this? Come on over, this, everybody. These, it's fun these, over there. These are these Europe. You know, Europe are just trying to punish us. No, 
what Europe are doing are securing their borders. Um, and so, so you know, so like there's that, this, the sorry, to, is a real, to a real issue. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So to, to, to harp on on this a little bit, but do you think, because this was what I think from my point of view, everyone had been saying from the start, you know, in, these, in yep. this whole Brexit conversation two years ago, people were saying, well, if you Brexit, you can't come in without a passport or, or visa or, you know, you might have an agreement with the EU, but you still need your passport, right? And you, you come in without, with the non-EU members. And how are people only realizing this now, I guess, is my first question. And the second one is, do you think it's very difficult to assess the opinion of the entire country, from, especially from your bubble? Yeah, uh, yeah. But do you think... If the vote was taken again today, I'm sure there are hardcore Brexiters which would, no matter what happens, they would still want to Brexit. And and some people that are unhappy, that feel cheated, whatever. But do you think the vote would have a different result nowadays? Well, this is a this is a, a, another point I was going to bring up is um, there actually has been there have been polls recently, and they are all swinging remain 55, 45 percent now. Mm. Um, there is there is a, a growing movement. There was a march in London a few weeks ago where seven hundred thousand uh, people. Uh, march through London um, and, the, you know, carrying European flags. Um, there's a movement called Our Future, Our Choice, um, which is which is absolutely amazing. There's a guy called, uh, I have to actually uh, read his name because his surname's uh, Femi Oluwole, O-L-U-W-O-L-E. He's on Twitter and he started out as a student on the streets the day after the Brexit vote with a with a handwritten t-shirt and he's turned it into this huge movement basically saying his message is um, by the time Brexit happens those of voting age will be um, overwhelmingly pro uh, remain uh, because people who have turned 18 in that time um, you know the, the the younger vote is very much pro remain and they see it and and his his message is the older population have voted to leave but actually the country is going to be you know for the younger people in 50 years time etc when the older people are going to go and and brexit the brexit uh, movement are now saying well we are going to take a hit we're not going to have more money you know the nhs is going to is not going to have 350 pound million pounds a week in fact you're going to have to cut back a bit more um and uh you, we're going to have to you know, tighten our belts for a little bit. There's people saying, you know, we did this after World War II. We had uh, we had rationing. We can do it again. And you know, people who voted Remain are saying, well, why are we doing this? <laughs> you know, the government is is stockpiling medicines because there might be problems with the border after 29th of March next year. Um, we're being we're being told all sorts of things about um, they they're building a car park, a huge sorry truck stop, huge truck stop. Apparently, I'm not necessarily. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're building a huge truck stop because they know it in Kent, which is down by Dover, um, so that they can park all the trucks that are going to be waiting for customs checks. Um, and the, the local residents all voted that was a very leave uh, area. And they're turning around saying, what's this? You know, this isn't what we voted for. This actually, this is. So your um, impression is that, and again, I know there are some people listening to this who are who lean towards Brexit, who are saying, oh, you're biased and, you know, but what's happening now is what we were saying was going to happen. And I think, okay, to give the other perspective, there are some people who are saying, well, Theresa May never really wanted to Brexit, so she dragged her heels oh, yeah. and, and didn't prepare for a hard Brexit which could have been ready by now after 18 months or whatever. And now, of course, it's impossible, but it could have been done. And so she's forcing the, the deal she is uh, putting together down our throats but because she didn't prepare uh, um, adequately. Yeah. Um, yes, and people are saying that, and they're, they're all clinging to that and saying that, uh, you know, this should have been sorted out years ago, months ago. Um, but 
uh, two years ago after the Brexit vote, um, they said this is going to be the easiest deal in history. They said it was going to be so simple, there wouldn't be any issues with it, we'll just push it through. Oh, and, meaning uh, they did, a, a hard Brexit wasn't really needed, you could negotiate your Brexit with the oh, EU no. and it was going to be easy. Yeah, we'd be like Norway or something like that. And yeah. uh, and and they said after the Brexit vote, a lot of people backtracked and said, well, you know, it's we weren't we didn't really say we were going for a hard Brexit. We'll just go for a, you know, a, a soft one and an event. And what's happened now within the Conservative government is that they've uh, they've all gone hard Brexit. Um, a part of me thinks, well, maybe Theresa May said, OK, well, you hardliners take the reins and let's see you fail miserably. Um, and then, you know, I'll pick up the pieces once you're done. I don't know. I don't know if it's a long play by her, but it's a very risky one if she's doing it. And she is actually playing with people's lives because there are people with, uh, you know, people with diabetes who might not get their insulin, etc. And uh, we don't yeah. have a we don't have a culture here of 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 GoFundMe pages for people who, who need who need medicine. So um, it, 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 yeah. it, it, it is an issue. And then I'll just throw in one more thing that's that's come up uh, today is uh, Spain have turned around and said, well, you this what's going to happen with Gibraltar? Uh, mm. Because Gibraltar is a is a British territory and uh, they're not happy with the arrangements that have been made. They don't want yeah. They don't want it. And apparently Argentina is sitting by because they think Britain's weak now and, and going to want to, I know they're not in Europe, but they, you know, they're eyeing the Falklands up again. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very difficult. There are lots of things within the de within the deal that don't make sense. Um, That's the most disheartening thing. And the thing that that strikes, I think, us in, in France and uh, to be honest, in the entire EU, uh, even even the anti-EU sentiments from the far right and far left uh, that were displayed in uh, the last election in 2017, I think, um, have been kind of qualmed uh, because people realized that that wasn't holding in France. There were, you know, some French mm -hmm. people who were like, ah, oh, you sucks. But over, overall, uh, the French population is it likes the idea of the EU, even if there are things that need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking at this and thinking, what the hell are you doing? And, you know, it was bad enough when the Brexit was voted and when the negotiations started. But now it's like I made the joke on Twitter that in the US, it, like that the Brexit makes Trump look reasonable. Because yep. a, a lot of the, you know, I've been saying this, a lot of the policies that Trump has been implementing and or his government has be, have been implementing, I don't think would have been very different if someone else had been in place. So, in a, you know, another conservative, of course, you know, if Rubio yeah. or whatever uh, a GOP candidate had been elected, I think most of the policies, actual policies would have been somewhat similar. Maybe not as extreme, but it's not like the entire thing would have been different. Um, they would have had yeah. nicer Twitter posts to go along with that. <laughs> That's for sure. So in effect, well, what Trump is doing is a lot of noise, but I don't think in po policy. And, and I think, you know, uh, uh, transgender people might take issue with what I'm saying here, the ban of, on mm -hmm. Muslim countries, quote unquote. Yes, I agree. But, you know, overall, in the case of Brexit, it was pretty bad to begin with. And now it's kind of this explosion of, of nonsense and and, you know, it's not misunderstanding. In French, you can say, uh, uh, that, you know, there's no understanding of anything that's happening. It's bewilderment, I guess. But anyway. Yeah, All right. It, we, we have to move on, but go ahead. Yep. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say, and, and people in Scotland are getting more and more uh, frustrated. Um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon was only notified of the deal. Uh, I think it was the, the, the day after um, it, was, it was agreed, and she was summoned to Westminster on, I think it was the Tuesday. Um, uh, and, she, you know, she had commitments, so she couldn't go. So the West, so Theresa May said, oh, she's ignoring us. She doesn't want to be involved. Yet, yet she hasn't been involved the whole way. She was just summoned mm. to have a look and discuss it. So um, there are things rumbling. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it feels like you know, I, I just one one more thing on Brexit is that one of the other things I work in local government, and one of the things about government 
local government, I think it's all over the world, is that things move slowly. Um, and even if we had had a good deal agreed within six months of the Brexit vote, we would leaving on the, on the 29th of March was not realistic. Um, I, we have, a, within, within my, the area where I work, we're deciding whether to outsource a, um, a service or to keep it in-house or to split it, etc. And it's recognized that that, this is just one service within the local council and a couple of businesses. That's going to take about two years to sort out. I don't see... I don't see Brexit. I don't see the European United Kingdom um, dismant disassembling all its little fingers in in Europe. You know, Eurotom and uh, the obviously the courts and all of these things without long, long and lengthy individual negotiations with all of those things. One. I don't yeah. know how five, even if it's a five hundred page uh, document, it's not going to cover things. So th th there's a reality that I think nobody's actually realised is the administration required to to push this through is going to take a long time. Anything else is not reality. So and and I um, think there's there's a, a a sentiment that this administrative uh, uh, slowness and heaviness comes from the EU. Which is not the case, you know. <laughs> governments are are machines that are very complicated. I hate to say, yeah. you know, especially in the U.S., there's this sentiment that the, that governments are inefficient and essentially crap, uh, mm -hmm. and that if only we could do without the government, everything would be great. But it's only because you, you know, you essentially assign every difficult job to the government, mm -hmm. and 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 it is difficult, and it takes time and people and and minutia. And the people who do it are qualified people who who spend time doing this. So, of course, as with the EU, there can only be they co can always be improvements. But in the case of the administration of Great Britain and of the UK, this has been built as you know a, a, a nation, an empire, a, a union over depending how you look at it, you know, uh, uh, fifty years or hundreds of years. And it, you can't fix it. You can't change it fundamentally in no. six months or in two years. It takes, no. it, I don't know, a decade. Take, listen, listen. 15. If you had a stronger negotiator who wouldn't let the EU push Theresa May around, this would have gotten done, <laughs> you guys. All right? You, you know, just need I, to, to not, not let them yeah. force you into agreeing to some backstop customs union. Uh, the UK can survive a hard uh, Brexit on its own. It's a strong economy. It can make deals with uh -huh, the US uh -huh. uh, and make deals better on its own. Uh, Theresa May just needs a little more backbone to make this work. So, yes. so, Tom, you're joking, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, I am expressing the leave opinion uh, for those I'll, that, listening. I'll frustrated. say one thing. I'll say one thing about Theresa May. She's getting like she's getting bashed from every side. I think and I don't know enough about her, so I might be completely wrong, but I really think she's a hero. And she is taking yeah. everything on the chin and still doing the response. She could just, you know, throw her hands in the air and say, you want a hard Brexit? Fine, we're hard brexiting now. Have fun yeah. and leave. You know she could she could absolutely do a number of things that would appear to get to do what people want. But obviously, in the end, the the British population would suffer immensely. Uh, and she's doing the responsible thing, doing the trying to ke keep this whole thing together mm -hmm. and. Uh, be becoming immensely unpopular, unpopular with the entire population in the process, but she's still doing it. I don't know. It seems to me like yeah. that's her what's name's happening. Theresa May, not Theresa Will. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, two things, and and it'll be the last I say on it. One is uh, I'm beginning to see what you what you say there about Theresa May. I, I used to, I I was very anti her, but uh, more recently I'm seeing she's doing what she can with the tools. The second is my response to that lever uh, who, who was on here with the, with the American accent, but you know, he might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that it doesn't matter how much you, you, how much will you have and how much belief in yourself you have, you cannot negotiate with a horse trader to get a unicorn. 
it just is not possible. <laughs> so, you know, this 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 is what it is. The British want a unicorn. The the EU are saying we'll give you this horse. That's what that's all we can give you. So that that's my final word on the matter. And I'm sorry, I, I you Patrick, you sent me a message and said please be as impartial as possible, but I I can't. I just can't anymore. <laughs> I think this is yeah no I I I mean I agree with you and uh, I don't know it's, I would love I would love you to have a, a hardcore Brexiter come on this on on I your mean, podcast I'd love to hear their 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 views on this I really I would. think I think I might be wrong and I'm sure we're gonna get some uh uh you know I'm gonna get some messages for some reason for this show people prefer to send me private messages than comment right. on the on the the blog which mm -hmm. please come and comment on the blog but um usually what I've gotten is we can just hard brexit it's not that hard uh well <laughs> actually it is a hard brexit. it won't be as bad as everyone says exactly yeah. it won't be as right. bad as everyone says which I mean sure maybe um <sighs> I really don't think so but Anyway, uh, yeah. okay, just to round uh, off the conversation about Brexit, because we do have to move on. Uh, yes. Tom, you joked about the uh, Brexiter, you didn't joke, you presented the Brexiter arguments. Thank you. Um, what does the US think about this? Oh, uh, the US as a whole, always... it's one unified uh, opinion <laughs> right. well, about the Brexit. It's always difficult for me to say because my perspective is not typical uh, of the U.S. perspective. But but largely, uh, it comes down to your political party here. It, it, politics is such a team sport right now. If you're a Democrat, uh, you think it's all crazy uh, and it's Trump-like people trying to ruin uh, Britain. But we've got enough problems over here on our own. Hopefully, you know, good good luck over there. Uh, and, and if you're a Republican, it's... Uh, you know, people are making a, a bigger deal out of that than it is. I'm sure they'll be fine. Uh, good for them for for fighting for for economic independence. Uh, go go team Brexit. Uh, but we have enough troubles over here. So good luck with that. So the the, mm. the unifying theme is sort of like, wow, that's interesting. Good luck with that. We've got a lot going on here. <laughs> I will say I will admit that I think the pictures being painted of a post post hard Brexit UK are a little bit you know, post-apocalyptic, like, uh, Walking Dead type thing. And I think that's a little bit exaggerated. Uh, I, I, uh, I do think it would be economically very difficult. And the people who voted for Brexit would be worse off than they mm. were before and would probably blame Theresa May for it, even if she did what they asked for, which is a hard Brexit. Uh, but anyway, okay. Uh, go ahead, Bruce, and then we. No, I'm just, I'm just saying it's not, it's not going to be as bad as, as, as it's not going to be Walking Dead, but uh, we're already feeling the the impact of uh, of Brexit. People are leaving, uh, Europeans are leaving. Uh, they don't know. Companies are pulling out. Uh, you know, there was a there was a case last week where um, I think it's in Lanetli. La I can't say it properly in in Wales. Uh, a big car manufacturer have, have pulled out. Said no, we 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 can't deal with this, this uncertainty so we're moving our factory and this was something that was said so people are already losing their jobs um and and it's it's unfortunate that the that the people who are going to get hit worst are the ones who voted leave they wanted to stand up and say to the government listen to us you've ignored us for too long um but they're the ones who are going to get hit the most so you know the the Brexit voter. As much as we can laugh and say, "Ha ha ha ha," uh, don't you? You know, aren't, you're not very worldly, are you? Um, you've got to sort of sit and say, "Well, why did they vote that way?" And and I, and I urge anyone to to follow. Um, I'll, I'll maybe give his his uh, his details to Patrick Femi on Twitter because he does argue this a lot better than I could, and he's worth he's really worth listening to. He wants to understand why people voted for brexit and he wants to convince people that it's not a good idea because because of what he sees so so anyway i said that was the last thing and then I'm, I'm <laughs> just, I'm certainly... that's fine it's yeah. i mean it's definitely our main conversation today mm -hmm. and i think what comes out of it is uh, we don't understand what's happening and the tragedy is that no one no don't, one don't. is understanding what's happening no one not the leavers not the remainers not the government not the eu no one. Um, 
When, when I went back to live in Zimbabwe in 2010, there was a saying there that said, uh, uh, if you understand, if you say you understand Zimbabwean politics, then you don't. Um, <laughs> and I think that, I think that, I think that, 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 comes you know that's brexit right now if you think you understand it actually you you don't because <laughs> that that's my that's the way i see it yeah. maybe i'm just dumb uh, well if you think you understand it is going to make for a great title so uh thank you <laughs> okay, we... uh tom what is happening in uh california apparently so first of all what is happening mm. and how are your two crazy political parties making it about the fact that the other one is the worst thing ever invented. Yeah, it's hmm, that I'll deal with what's happening first. That's the okay. easier question. Uh, what happening is, is the state is now smoldering, but not burning. Uh, and for the large part of the last month, uh, large areas of the state have been on fire. Uh, there is part of, of this that I think is misunderstood is that forest fires happen. Uh, the, you will never not have forest fires. However, forest fires don't need to happen as often as they're happening, and they don't need to happen in as large of a scale as they're happening. Uh, there were three big fires. There were a lot more than three, but there were three big fires. Uh, one is the Camp Fire up in Northern California that was started out in a place called Paradise outside of Sacramento. That's nearer to San Francisco. It's on that, that end of the state. And then there was the Hill Fire and the Woolsey Fire down in Southern California, uh, both both just sort of in the northern area of the Los Angeles region. Uh, the Hill Fire was the least of the three, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that as much. The Woolsey Fire uh, was a big fire. We had a lot of smoke here in Los Angeles uh, to the point that you really shouldn't have been walking outside without a mask, uh, even in my neighborhood. And it got a lot of attention because it burned down through Malibu, where a lot of celebrities live. So there was, you know, there was that added uh, in item of interest to that fire where you, you had celebrities' houses burning down. Um, uh, Miley Cyrus lost her house, for instance. And and that always adds a little, you know, you 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 can't help but like, wow, it's not just, you know, a poor person lost their house, but this is a person I've heard of and is very famous. Uh, however, the the biggest fire and the most tragic fire and the one that cost uh, hundreds of people their lives is the Paradise Area Fire, the, the, the Camp Fire. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and that fire, even last weekend, I was up in the Bay Area uh, visiting family and uh, there was still smoke in the air. It was still unhealthy to be outside. It was just getting to the point where you didn't necessarily have to wear a mask if you if you weren't sensitive to it. Uh, but it was bad. And uh, the ca cause of these fires is still being determined. They believe humans may have been uh, at at fault in one of the Southern Californian fires uh, for for basically I guess it could be considered arson, but but probably more negligence. They believe that the the fire up in Northern California was possibly caused by an electrical fault from the power company, uh, sparks being thrown off, and in all of those cases the dry conditions of California, the fact that we haven't had a lot of rain, uh, exacerbates it. It makes the fires easier to catch and it makes them spread faster. Uh, what has, uh, what has happened is, is tragic. And, and what I, what I want to say is that the emergency personnel, the firefighters, uh, in the state of California have done a heroic, unbelievable job in being able to contain and fight something that, honestly uh, looked impossible at one point uh the 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 Woolsey fire here in, in southern california took a week to get contained at all it was just burning out of control uh even worse was that uh, campfire up in uh, paradise in northern california uh, which took weeks to get any kind of containment on so these were impossible situations that uh state personnel government personnel firefighters Uh, and emergency personnel uh, were able to, to, to save lives, even as many lives as were lost, were able to save lives, save property, uh, and, and, and pull off an impossible job. So when you say, you know, it was impossible to fight, 
was the expectation that the fires would keep burning and like burn down all of California? Like I have a hard time understanding. <laughs> well, maybe not all of California. It's a very right. big state. Uh, but that that they would they would not end until they burned themselves out. Uh, they they could have mm. burned into cities, uh, you know, if if not properly contained. So yeah, there were there were points in the Woolsey fire, and there there were a lot of points in the Hill fire where. Uh, it was uncertain where where it would end, where where the fire would stop, and it was at the mercy of the winds and the weather what it was going to do. I see. Um, I had friends who were evacuated for a week uh, from their house here in the Los Angeles area. Their house is fine. The fire didn't get to them, but they weren't there. Were, it was dangerous for them to go there because no one knew. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so. I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, because, again, the perspective from the outside is, at least for me, it was this. Um, one thing that was really shocking when this whole thing started, I think 10 days ago, was the the, the thing that uh, President Trump tweeted uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, but I just... No, uh, it's I just was going to go there, and I, I made you go there for me, so, you know. <laughs> okay, well, excellent. I'm happy to be a service, but, you know, we're talking about, <laughs> you know, not understanding things, uh, but there was one tweet by, yeah. by President Trump who is not known for his restraint on social media, but this one was like, to me, it was above everything else, where he was essentially saying, you know, putting the blame on California. Yeah, we we don't was, need it, to get into it too much. No, but. it was a dirty trick. Uh, it, what President Trump does, in my opinion, is says things a lot on Twitter, mostly, in order to fire up his base and get the opposition angry at him so that they say and do things that also fire up his base. It's a brilliant strategy. Right. So I guess uh, I my question there I, well, is... Well, hold on, hold on. I okay. generally ignore everything he says mm. on Twitter. Uh, and and I 100% agree with you earlier that a large portion, not everything, but a large portion of what his administration has done would have been done by a, another Republican administration. And he is not nearly as controversial as he wants his opposition to treat him. This was an example of that. Uh, he knew if he went on Twitter and said, well, you know, California had better forestry management, this wouldn't happen, uh, that it would get a lot of people angry uh, and yelling at him. And that's what he wants. Uh, mm. However, this is one where I, I personally being affected, walking outside and, and not being able to breathe in two areas of the state over the period of a month, uh, didn't appreciate. Uh, the, the folks that were fighting this fire did not need to have the population it, it stirred up at that time by, by some kind of partisan rhetoric trick. Uh, it's, 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 it just wasn't nice. And <laughs> thankfully, uh, you know, the, the, the folks on the ground who were fighting the fire did the right thing. They ignored it <laughs> and they got on with the job of fighting the fire. Uh, forestry management certainly could be better. It always could be better. And in fact, uh, Governor Jerry Brown, our, our governor, has issued some some orders in the wake of the fire uh, to allow for more thinning of the forests, uh, which would which would, you know, retard uh, forest fires in the future. Uh, and, and that's an adjustment that could and should be made. Uh, but politicizing it like that at that moment uh, really did not go well down with all Californians, yeah. uh, whether, no matter what political stripe you were. Yeah, it's not like California. It's it, you know, overall, like Trump to begin with, but it's interesting that you said there's me. a lot. Of, there's a lot of Trump support in California, sure. especially in the Valley and especially in the outer counties. It's interesting that you said, you know, me being affected by the thing he was talking about, I didn't appreciate it. That's I don't. Know, it's interesting because you know it makes it harder to ignore, right? Exactly. When but I think when, it, when he's like, talking about the economy or something like that, I'm like, hey, that's what he says on Twitter. He wants you to get mad. Uh, if if you know, just just don't don't feed the beast. Uh, but when you're sitting here thinking like, gosh, we need help, we need support, we need everybody to get together and, and unite whatever political stripe to fight this, and then the president is leading the way by criticizing forestry management, it's just disheartening. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. My point was going to be. It's, you know, the other people that he's talking about are probably feeling the same way when he's talking about them, uh, when we might look at it and think, oh, you know, just ignore him. He's just making noise. Yeah, yeah. So, right. And, and you're right. You, you should. It just makes it harder. Yeah. I'm, That's why I'm, it's such an effective strategy, right? I, I, my, the other question I wanted to ask was, did his base 
have a a a little bit of a reaction you know to this thinking dude okay that's that's maybe you know was he as effective with this as he was with his usual twitter uh, inflammatory rhetoric or was there a little bit of a uh uh of a, a reaction to this on you know conservative media like fox news or whatever maybe you don't. I, I don't know i i don't watch okay. or, or or consume <laughs> conservative or liberal media either <laughs> one so i i couldn't tell you i i haven't spoken to anyone who's a big Trump supporter about that particular thing, uh, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to know. Generally, though, what happens if you're someone who supports Trump, what I what I have observed is when he says stuff like that, they shake their head and like, yeah, you know, he talks a lot. He's pig headed. That's yeah. that's that's who he is. But but I like what he's doing and I like what he's getting done. And right. so I don't I don't believe that this in any way was any different. That's my. Uh, I've actually started um, listening to Ben Shapiro's show a little bit. Mm. I haven't started to listen, but I've listened to a few at the uh, behest of our good friend uh, Tony, who's a uh, conservative, and mm-hmm. I-, I find that uh, that's also what he does. He kind of, you know, uh, diminishes the importance of what Trump says by making fun of him and. That's an interesting, you know, even in his camp, there's a little bit of that when you're um, trying to appear more neutral. I I would have a lot of things to say about uh, Ben Shapiro, and I think I might uh, uh, talk about about this a little bit later. Um, It it sounds like he's really, uh, he he exposes the same views that I heard uh, Scaramucci give in an interview with The Economist, which... Uh, if you if you are interested in understanding, uh, not just disagreeing, but understanding uh, the Republican side of this, and you don't listen to Scaramucci's interview with the Economist, because Scaramucci was the guy who famously, you know, lasted a few weeks uh, in the administration, but he had been part of the Trump campaign before that, uh, and he he lays it out very clearly in a way mm-hmm. that if Democrats don't listen to what he is saying, they they will not win the presidency in 2020. Right. I I wasn't I didn't listen to. Shapiro's reaction about this comment specifically, but in general, and I would suspect that was the same. Yeah, thing. it feels like um, the same thing. Scaramucci's yeah. uh, criticism of, of the president is that he's pigheaded, right? Uh, that that he he gets he gets his back up and he says things because he's angry. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and 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 I think that's the thing that the Democrats are not understanding, and and they're going to lose. Yeah, I I think there's a lot of uh, that's a completely different conversation and we will have it at some point uh but i would i could discuss it as well uh but yeah so from here we didn't really (laughs) uh uh understand much of what was happening but the thing we our mind races to i think when we hear about these things is climate change um oh yeah and and that's kind of i don't think we're we're thinking oh this is all because of climate change but immediately what we're thinking is is climate change, which his men caused, can't be helping this situation. And that's, I think, the framing for this, you know, news that we have in Europe. It's a little glib to go, it's it's not quite the same extent, but it's a little glib to say, now we will use this tragedy that's killing people uh, to fight, uh, you know, for climate change. But at the same time... So, sorry, let me interrupt. I want to add, we're not using it to uh uh to think oh this would be good ammo to fight climate change that is not our the way we're framing it and i want to make this clear i think we're in, in again in france at least most of us are very cognizant of the fact that climate change is real and so when we see this it's kind of impossible to dissociate the two and think and we think well it can't help, but we're not thinking, oh, look, we're going to point to this and say, look, climate change is real, so we have to fight it. That's not at all where we're going. It's just, hmm, well, this seems to be linked to that, probably. Well, f- f- and first that's of all, it. I wasn't accusing you of that. I was no, saying I understand. it yeah. could be glib if you did that. Right. Uh, but but to, to the point, the point that I was going to try to make there was, uh, while that could be considered a, a problem, uh, it is true that the fact that we have less rain in in California uh, is is one of the anticipated effects, and the dryness is one of the anticipated effects. Uh, so it's something you're going to have to get used to here. 
uh, in this part of the world that we are, we are going we are going to continue to be at a higher risk of fire. We're going to be at a higher risk of drought, and that's just the way it's going to be, and it's not going to get better. Hmm. Yeah, we could talk about climate change and uh, these issues at length. Um, what kind of depresses me in advance is that you know a p large part of my audience of the audience for this show is in the U.S. And I think immediately that audience would frame this discussion by attributing one opinion or the other to one or the other parties. And yeah, no, it's the sickness we have in the United yeah. States is that no, everybody, like I said, it's a team sport now. So you can't have an actual opinion. Uh, you have to pick the opinion that, that it goes with your team. Exactly, and if you pick yeah. an opinion that is not on that team, then people assume you're on the other team. Exactly. And <laughs> reality doesn't necessarily have a team. And either yeah. climate change is real or it isn't. I mean, it's pretty... Also, I hate all the teams. They're crappy <laughs> too, teams. Honestly. And uh, okay, It's not this... even Premier League. It's not even Second Division. It's just the worst. This is also another conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. We're having 15 different conversations. At the same time. But that's how it goes. Of, yeah. I, you know, I wish our entire life could be a... Helios Club episode where we <laughs> just all speak in a friendly manner to one another. Uh, Bruce, anything you want to add about the forest fires because before I conclude this episode with Finnish babies and uh, and and jackets for drivers? Uh, you're muted. No, I think I think that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so, a uh, couple of things I wanted to mention, and one very quick and one a little bit more lengthy. Uh, the first one is uh, birth rates in Finland, uh, which the latest report from uh, the, the national organization agency that manages or at least reports on these things is uh, quite dire. The birth rate in Finland has fallen to, I believe, 1.48, um, which is obviously not good if you want to renew the population. And looking at it from the French uh, perspective, it was really interesting because in France, we have a, a higher birth rate and we have tax incentives for uh, uh, people who have several children. I mean, already from the first child, you get your um, general you know, revenue tax uh, reduced for having a child. Uh, if you have two children, again, it's reduced. If you have three, it's reduced more. And you get all sorts of benefits for what we call uh, uh, famille nombreuse, which is <laughs> a large family, I guess. Um, and, and so this is a very healthy way, I think, to uh, encourage people to have children, which is a... Or, or I guess for me, it seems healthy because it feels natural. Like... Western societies have a tendency to have less children uh, than, than uh, 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 others, and so you need to encourage it. And in order to do that, you need government, quote-unquote, intervention. Um, so this feels very natural. Another thing that you need if your population is declining is uh, possibly to have immigration. That's a great way of uh, adding workforce age people to your population. And uh, sometimes they will even have higher birth rates than uh, your current population. That is also something that helps uh, the, the French population not grow, but diminish less than it would it does in other countries. We have uh, some immigration. And Finland is very, very adverse to immigration. Like, they <laughs> do not want other people. I mean, uh, surely if you're, the color of your skin is lighter, you're probably okay to immigrate. Uh, I didn't have a lot of issues. Well, I'm in the EU, so they didn't have a choice. But uh, yeah, they don't really like immigration. Um, so more than, than most other uh, countries. Which, by the way is probably due more to the fear that the Russians start start to immigrate than to the fear that, well, I don't know, they don't really like those dark-skinned people. And I'm casting a wide net. I know not everyone's like this in Finland, but still, immigration is a no-go. So I think they're going to have to change their stance on um, tax incentives, which, about time, is my reaction. Um, I wonder if you guys have any... 
uh, uh, different reaction to the issue of birth, birth rate and how to encourage uh, higher birth rates, which obviously are needed in many parts of our Western uh, countries. Yeah, I mean, well, it, it, I feel like, uh, and I, I don't know if Bruce will agree with this, but uh, I'm sitting in a country who doesn't have that problem because of immigration, and immigration <laughs> is the bigger issue, right? So you're solving it with uh, Mexicans that have lots of babies that will grow up to be criminals, well, essentially. Or cowboys, they could, you know, they could, yeah, despite both their mama's best are. wishes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, it, it's not an issue. It's not, it's not mm. something that, that is on the national agenda here. Uh, the, the idea is we, we have too many people coming into the country seems to be what most people want to right. talk about. Not, we are not, we're not giving up or I, you know, it would be an interesting, uh, gambit for one of the parties to, to take up, take this up as its cause to say, you know what this problem problem is, we need to have more babies in the United States, but <laughs> I don't think they will. And, and it is a, a a trend that isn't moving as as fast as a lot of scientists thought it would. But as countries do develop, they tend to have lower birth rates. It's yeah. a big problem in Japan. Oh, yeah. In Japan, it's crazy. Like people aren't even getting married. It's like insane. But in Japan, it has more to do with social skills and, mm -hmm. and social awkwardness, which is like a, <laughs> a plague. Um but just for, for a little bit of context, uh, in the U.S., the birth rate is 1.8, which isn't too bad. Um, in the U.K., it's 1.8 as well. In France, it's 1.96. So that's really good uh, uh, in our you know, nation. Well, you know, they say French is for lovers. So There you go. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess the UK doesn't really have a big problem as well with this. They have <laughs> immigration, which is also a big problem. Not to say that immigration is not considered a problem in France, but uh, in, this, in this regard, it definitely helps. Uh, yeah, I guess the UK, it's not yeah, the, a problem either. No, no. You know, you'd get people who say otherwise, but um, mm. I know lots of our workforce and the care industry has a lot of immigrants. So. Right. Okay. Mm. Mm. Uh, so there you go. That was the immigration. Uh, no, the, the birth rate thing. The other thing, which is actually I'm burying the lead a little bit. It's a French uh, uh, movement that has been uh, taking uh, flight or importance in the past. Oh, can you mute yourself, Bruce? You're sorry. Oh, making a lot of noise. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, the yellow jackets uh, 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 movement, which is not the uh, other name of Ant-Man uh, throughout his illustrious <laughs> career. It's those, as we were talking about in the beginning of the show, those reflective jackets uh, that you put on when you go out on the on the street. If your car is uh, on the side of the road and you have an issue when you, you know, to, to be seen. And that started as a uh, protest against the increase of gas prices in, in the country. Um, and it sort of ballooned into a complaint against the increase of um, the, the cost of living and has become a national movement. The, the, the peculiar thing about it, or I guess we've seen it somewhere else, which is the point I'm going to make, but the peculiar thing is that it is not a politically led movement. It's not like the uh, France Insoumise, which is the most natural uh, 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 political party to spearhead these kinds of things because it's the far left movement uh, that was quite successful in the last e election. So it's, it doesn't come from there, even though they've been, you know, screaming about these things for a long time. It doesn't come from the far left, uh, the far right either, uh, even though, again, uh, they have been saying things like this uh, for a long time. But it's really a uh, 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 an anonymous citizen movement in the same way that we've seen for uh, Occupy Wall Street and and other similar movements where where it's very difficult to deal with because they have no leader, they have no demands, uh, they have no agenda, and it's just a bunch of people going down in the street saying we're unhappy about the cost of living and what they're doing specifically is uh, stopping cars from uh, uh, going on the street. So they're going to do demonstrations where they go in the street and block the circulation, the, the, the traffic. 
um, in the street and it's happening in more and more cities usually without any casualties or without any problem it's relatively uh, uh, good spirited uh, but there is one uh, planned in Paris for this weekend and this is the one that people are a little bit afraid about because since there's no organization behind it. It's difficult to make sure things go well. And it's also very difficult to make sure that uh, people who come to just break stuff, as happens with every demonstration, um, aren't in, you know, don't take part uh, in that movement. And it seems like it's going to be a significant one in Paris this week, uh, this weekend. And obviously, it is very much against, you know, anti the government and what it's been doing. And it's saying that... The cost of living are increasing. We are but poor uh, uh, citizens and you don't care about us and you need you should pay attention to us a little bit more or a lot more. And yeah, that is how I can um, characterize it at this point. I have no idea where it's going to go. It could die down after this weekend. Um, it could flare up into a full-blown... A uh, uh, movement that would bring down the government. I have no idea. It's nowhere near that at this point. Um, we've seen a bunch of, you know, people, and and whatever happens in those cases is happening now. Meaning, uh, you have pictures on Twitter that are showing immense masses of of yellow jacket wearing people in the streets and then people noticing that those pictures are either from other events or have been doctored but not before they have been retweeted thousands of time uh, of times and overall i think the movement is not super uh uh like there aren't a huge amount of people doing it but of course with our current world Anyone doing something has a voice that is heard throughout the country, so uh, it's making a lot of noise. And I guess the real test is going to be what's going to happen this weekend in Paris, because there you can actually see and count and, and realize for real what is happening. And if it's a large movement, um, it will be it will have an impact. If it's a small movement, it might die down. But again, the most interesting part of it is the fact that no leader. It's like a citizens' movement. Um. It's interesting, Patrick. I'm just I'm just looking at it. It, it says the, the side I'm saying it said there've been two deaths and uh, and like almost 500 wounded. I, am I looking at the right thing? Yeah, yellow yellow vest <laughs> protest yellow because vest, yeah. um, it that sort of thing in the UK would be classed as riots, I suppose, with police mm. uh, police wounded as well. And it's uh, it's interesting. The French there's a there's a view of the French here as always protesting, but uh, mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I hadn't to be honest. I hadn't even heard about the deaths. I haven't been following it incredibly right. closely. Um, but there was one situation where someone's car was being jostled by a dozen oh, or so right, protesters, right. and and then she ran. She 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 sort of hit the accelerator, and I think killed somebody because she panicked. Right. Yeah, I think yes. I actually I had heard about that one, um, but that tells you something. I it doesn't really hit the threshold of yeah. oh well. In that case, it should be prevented. Um, it's just incidents happen when you have these kinds of things that are um, that take place, and we don't take away people's right to demonstrate. Um, and sometimes they get a little bit rowdy, I suppose. But yeah. overall, um, overall, they, the the current news climate is that they are the opposite of rowdy. They are yeah. behaving well and. Yeah, so it's it's, de it's definitely. Uh, it, I wonder. It's it's a different type of populist movement, isn't it? That's uh, that's coming yeah. out. It's it's almost like a like it's actually grassroots, not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, not absolutely. It's definitely grassroots. I mean, there are there are uh, uh, reports currently of the mod the movement being radicalized to some extent, and it's hard mm -hmm. to know if the government is kind of pushing this narrative to kind of try and split the movement, uh, it's, which might be the case. But it's definitely grassroots to the dismay 
of <laughs> political parties like the France Insoumise and the Front National or whatever the name of that movement has become now. Uh, Marine Le Pen's movement is, I think it's, mm -hmm. I can't remember. Um, because they would have liked to initiate these kinds of things. But it's 100% more Occupy Wall Street than it is um, a, a political party-led thing. I do but think that, that one thing folks who have been on the side that benefited from, from Brexit or Make America Great Again uh, may not realize is there is an underlying frustration that those movements took advantage of that the prescriptions of those movements don't solve. Uh, yep. And and I feel like what you're seeing here is re like the real frustration coming out of uh, that. No, it's not about your cause. It's about our life. A little yeah. bit. Yeah, I think there's definitely uh, 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 it's there seems to be a, a, a diff diffuse uh, 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 like an untouchable consciousness in that movement, which warns the political parties against uh, trying to take it as their own cause. Um, they don't want to be récupéré, we say in French, uh, to be taken over or used by political parties. And, and smartly, the parties are staying away from that idea. They're saying, you know, explicitly saying, we don't want to use that movement, but you are, you know, they're all trying to play around it and, and try to see how it would benefit their cause, which is legitimate, legitimate because many of the de of the demands, they don't even have demands, which is weird. They're just saying it's too, <laughs> things yeah. are too expensive. That is very Occupy Wall Street, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I don't know. I guess the, yeah. Go ahead, Bruce. I just, it just feels I, I have a very un un uh, unoriginal uh, you know, idea in that um, it's what's fueling most of the world's uh, unrest right now is 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 inequalities. Is um, mm -hmm. you know the it goes back uh, goes back to the one percent and uh, the people and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And and actually the UK <laughs> the UK is one of the worst now since Brexit. Mm. People are getting I, poorer, and and it, that's what fueled Brexit was exactly what Tom was saying was that. You know, there are people out there who are disenfranchised and life is getting harder for for, for most people while, uh, I don't know, I, I still believe in, in universal, I'm starting to see more and more that universal basic income is the answer to a lot of, uh, a lot of the world's problems. But that would oh, mean that's, people yeah, are the that's, top giving up their... Uh, their <laughs> you're, you're taking uh, it to like a, a super like far conclusion. But yeah, well, Patrick's uh, already hearing yeah. the emails he's getting from the no, people I mean, who oppose basic income. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Bruce, but, I, you know, I've been reading the uh, book by uh, Har uh, Harari, you know, Yuval Noah Harari, The 21 yeah. Lessons for the 21st yeah, yeah. Century. Uh, really interesting. I mean, he takes a lot of things to some extremes, but a lot of super interesting con contextualizations of what's been happening uh, in this, uh, um, you know, in these past few years. And I think one of the things that actually I have been thinking and saying for a while, which he also puts into words, is uh, this idea that the 1% is an issue. And I think it's very easy to do something which I do and used to do more, which is say, well, you know, what are people complaining about? We all have, you know, cell phones and enough mm -hmm. uh, money to eat. Yeah, you might not eat at the restaurant every night, but you have enough money to eat. A hundred years ago, we would starve every couple of years, uh, overdoing it, of course. But, you know, mm. that idea that now the basic uh, standard of living is so high that we shouldn't be complaining. And I still think that's true. However, uh, what is also true is that issues in inside societies arise not from the objective standard of living, but from the gap between the, the, the lower class and the, uh, the upper class. Um, and that gap, I think, has been widening. And that is definitely, definitely a concern. Yep. And if you don't want to have these kinds of things happen in your society, you need to make sure that you have a giant middle class and as little as possible lower class and as little as possible uh, upper class. doesn't mean you're not going to have issues, but creating a middle class is super, super important, um, regardless of what the objective standards are for any class. So, and this, as I, I guess, Tom, that's what you were saying, um, this 
a, a movement, I think, I think is an expression of people not fed up with the way they're living, because I think the people going in the street are not all super poor, but it's just this feeling that some people are getting more, a bigger part of the pie or cake, uh, mm -hmm. and it's unfair, this feeling on, of unfairness. And they want their eggs back from that cake to bring it full circle. <laughs> Thankfully, in France, we're not talking about getting the eggs back yet. It might come to that at some point. Well, but I, I do think, you, you know, I think it is, it's, it, you can get caught up with, oh, it's the 1%, uh, you know, and, and then the argument is like, well, what? It's, it's, it's bad to have rich people. You, you need that motivation to be rich. It's not about rich or poor, in my opinion. It's about a relative difference between opportunity. It's not, mm -hmm. as you said very well, it's not about I'm living badly. It's I'm not living as well as I see I could live, and I don't feel like I am, it is in within my reach. The system won't allow me to get there. That's the problem that I think the some of the people who are on the one percent side or the you know well it's it's you know we don't want to just take away all the rich people's uh, gains they worked hard for that they don't realize it's not about taking away it's about keeping the gap within reasonable distance so that everyone feels like they can achieve an improvement in their life too many people don't feel like an improvement to their life is possible right now that to me is the biggest yeah. problem i think in the u.s it's especially true um, mm -hmm. I, I, maybe. I, I think in, in France, maybe it's a little bit different overall, but regardless of the particular situation of each country, uh, there is also a reality, which is difficult to deny unless you willfully are trying to. And that's mm. the reality that this middle class, if it thins out, then you're going to have trouble. It doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter who is rich and if they want don't want to give their money to, to have it taken by the government or the poor or whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is that if you don't have a large middle class, you're going to have these tensions. And the, the, the thinner the middle class gets, the, the more intense those tensions uh, uh, start to become. And that is just, you know, it's just fact. I think I'm going to put a little caveat there. I think it's just that's how it works. That's how reality works. <laughs> that's and, also um, called a strong opinion when it's a fact. I think. <laughs> yes. Also, maybe I don't. But but I think there's there is something to that. Um, and and in how, France, it's not as bad as it is in other countries. But um, yeah, Tom. How do you create oh. that middle class then? Sorry. Uh, well, I, you, I honestly. How, Honestly, I think part of it is making sure that, uh, and, and we're veering off different topics again, but I think mm -hmm. it's making sure that everyone has access to uh, uh, affordable healthcare, uh, education, mm -hmm. and, and these kinds of things that make that difficulty l l less than it would be otherwise. In France, we have, uh, at least, you know, you're not going to die if you get sick. Your children are going to get a chance to have an education no matter where they're from and what they do. So mm. I guess that speaks to what Tom was saying. You have a feeling like, well, you're not going to have to sell your house, which is already on a mortgage, if you uh, get cancer, right? So, or, mm. or if you break your leg or whatever. So I think that plays into this idea that the middle class is, uh, uh, you know, through means attainable for more people. And again, I think this movement in France is part of that issue, probably. But I also think it's lessened by the fact that we have those safety nets that work for the entire population. So the class warfare, quote unquote, no matter what people tell you in the populist movements, I think is a lot less uh, 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 strenuous in France than in some other countries. Maybe I'm wrong there. Mm. All right. I, I've, I've, I've got. I've, yeah. I. I think my my views have gone more and more extreme as as time's gone on, and and it might be worth. It, maybe maybe we can have an episode later. I don't know it's about what about podcast, but I think the, the idea of universal basic income is is as the world gets more automated. Uh, I don't know. Well, though, you know, we creating a middle class. Um, uh, do we, do we have the jobs to do that? Do we have, 
you know, we've got enough food in the world. It's just a question of distribution, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. There's lots of very naive points that that uh, that I find um, I find very frustrating to uh, to to. Uh, well, I will say about, uh, it's, it's a new problem. That's why it's so <laughs> yeah, frustrating. Yeah, that, that's we it, we, yeah. we the, the problem isn't that people starve. It's that people may not get enough. The problem isn't isn't yeah. that we, we are unable to cure illnesses. It's that we we may not have it distributed uh, properly if, uh, accessibility. These we've gone from we need to we need to solve the fact that that people are dying out in the fields, you know, to yeah. hey, uh, people aren't living as well as we could make them live, which is a great problem, but it's it's a different problem and old solutions aren't going to work for it. So basic income is a really interesting thing. It's been tried in a few places. We've learned how it doesn't work, how it does yeah. work. And so whether basic income is the solution or not, I don't know. But it's certainly something to look at and study. And even if it's not the solution, trying it and experimenting with it and studying it is probably going to help lead us to the solution of what do we need to do? I mean, we basically have socialized clothing in the world ad hoc. Nobody is going around naked in the world because there's <laughs> so much clothing and people just give it away. And no one's objecting like, you know, this giving away of clothing is just a horrible thing. How dare we? Right. Uh -huh. be because we have so much abundance that it's solved itself. So, you know, there's something to the fact that we we can solve this, this stuff. We just need to try. Uh. And There's, I suppose in the yeah. Western world, there are very few people who are actually starving to death at the moment. Not in to death, Western, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, there are people who, who struggle, but um, mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of, I wouldn't say solved, but yeah. Uh, and I think in the process Europe, Europe, solved in all Europe, parts of the world, yeah. yeah. Europe, Europe, yeah. Has, Europe has solved to to a good to a good extent the NHS uh, the, the sorry <laughs> healthcare system um, because you know we do have socialized healthcare that works it's not perfect uh, I don't think any well, human system ever will be but, I think uh, honestly again anyway, I know this comes sorry. as a shock to our American listeners but everyone in the west you know in the Western world has solved universal healthcare to different degrees and with problems but everyone but the U S That is, Have you solved how to disincentivize large company interests from undermining sol solving healthcare? That's the problem in the U.S. Yes, of course, mm -hmm. of course. But I mean, th th I If think you solve you're... that, let us know because that's our problem. Well, I mean, we I don't know about that specifically, but we did solve <laughs> healthcare, and I think a lot of people don't see the 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 see healthcare in itself as an issue. And okay, let's not get dragged into a healthcare <laughs> yeah, conversation yeah, yeah. again. But the fact is, in Europe, in All of the Western world, healthcare is no longer an issue as a concept. Yes, there are ways of implementing it, and people argue about this uh, I don't to know no end. It's been solved everywhere in Africa, has it? No, no, no I'm I saying mean, in the Western world, mm, okay. like in in in, in first in world Africa. countries, definitely not in Africa. But about universal uh, uh, basic income, I was befuddled by the idea but the more i thought about it i think it is interesting and as tom said i think it should be tried i think there yeah. is something to it and interestingly uh, harari talks about it quite a bit as well uh, as one of the maybe things we might need to implement for other reasons again that book is really interesting go check it and out and a couple of places where it's try been tried it hasn't worked out as the believers expected uh, yeah. it hasn't been necessarily a failure but it hasn't provided quite the effect that right. folks wanted So, so, and I'm not saying that to say it's a bad idea. I'm saying it, it's not going to work the way everybody thinks until, till we, we do this, till we try it and figure yeah. out, well, maybe it's not basic income. Maybe it's this other way of doing it. Maybe it's some voucher system. And I, think, I don't even know. I, I think, it, you know, it, it's, it's being tried still, including in Finland in a few places. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be unconscionable. And no one is saying this, that you should implement universal basic income for a whole country From the, you know, from one day to the next. Right. That right. that is ridiculous, and you don't know what would happen. Is playing with fire, but trying yeah. it here and there and see what happens seems like a reasonable uh, way to do it. I wonder if it's one of those things. It's like uh, it's almost like Obamacare. You can't half implement 
socialized mm. medicine uh, yeah uh, because it won't work you can't sort of take mm -hmm. you, uh, you can't take one state and say i don't know what's an american state uh iowa Texas. ohio, <laughs> ohio. <laughs> take ohio and say you you know you're all gonna have socialized med uh, i don't know i think medical. i think you could massachusetts did it yeah so, i think uh, they, yeah. the, the oh, well, go, scale of know. a of a state is enough that you could do yeah, i mean yeah, depending yeah. on the state but <laughs> Maybe you can't Did take a work, town, though? like a single town. Yeah, it works yeah. fairly well in Massachusetts, okay, despite well. what the Republicans uh, would like you to think, because it was implemented by Republican Mitt Romney. <laughs> so, All right, well, we, we need to... More about that. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> but we need to go. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. uh, all the topics, all the conversations in the world would be super interesting, but we only had time for a few today. And I want yep. to thank both of you for uh, indulging me and the audience for indulging us uh, talking about all of this. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you guys and, and hear more about what you're doing, what would you recommend they do? Let's start with uh, Bruce. Uh, I'm just on Twitter. I'm a regular person who doesn't podcast as as, <laughs> as, as Patrick and, and Tom do. You can catch me on Bruce Woodward 3. I've only got a couple of hundred followers and I'm a very sad and depressed father who just <laughs> plods along in Scotland and tries to uh, tries to do the right thing. I'm, I'm sure you're going to get <laughs> lots of people to get in touch with you with that, that description. Uh, what, was yeah. the, what was the account again? Bruce Woodward 3. I'm um, uh, um, mm. I, I mainly been, uh, I don't know. I should post a lot, so there we go. Well, and, uh, I'm, I, I'll uh, <laughs> I'll include the link in the show notes so people who want to hear from a sad and depressed father of three from Scotland can do that. Yeah, I think it's a sad cat as his avatar. Uh, yes, yeah. No, uh, oh, which one is that? Yeah, I'd forgotten that one. Anyway, sorry. I think I think it's it's also good to have a, an interesting perspective on that that part of yeah. the world. Uh, the cat isn't sad. He's uh, uh, um, concerned, he's... maybe. No, no, it's it's uh, Black Panther, right? Oh. It's a Black Panther ca cat. Oh, or is maybe it? Not. Oh, okay. I didn't. I don't know. I maybe not. It's, it's he, a very, he looks a very Black Panther. It's a kitty. baby Black Panther. Yeah. Ah, oh, there you go. So there. Now. Yes. Now I see. I see the necklace. Now I get it. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody famous just followed me. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Merritt, uh, you seem famous. Where would people get a uh, hold of you? I am an irregular person because I do lots of podcasts, uh, and you can find them at TomMerritt.com. Uh, one that is probably uh, most relevant to people who might be listening to the Phileas Club is the Daily Tech News Show, uh, because we talk about tech news uh, and how it affects the world. Patrick Beja is one of our regular contributors, uh, co-hosting the show mostly on Tuesdays, uh, and you can find that at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Excellent. For me, it's uh, not Patrick. Yes, that's my uh, name on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Very easy. Not Patrick. See, you already you already remember it. It's Patrick with a not in front of it. Frenchspin.com for the blog with the uh, uh, all of the uh, podcasts that I do and the updates and the articles where you can come and comment on what we said and. If you really enjoy the show, if you had a good time, if you like what you heard, if you think it provides any kind of service to you, then you can also uh, support it on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Phileas Club. The link is in the show notes as well. So you can go check that out and become a supporter. It would be immensely appreciated because this show is entirely powered by Patreon. So thanks a million to those who already do it. You are the best people in the world, whatever your party allegiances are. I love all of you, and we will be back in a few weeks for a new episode. Talk to you then. Bye. Ooh, and happy Thanksgiving. And oh, happy Thanksgiving, other oh. usins. <laughs> <laughs>